Hey folks, it's Michael with the CCERP podcast, Cypress Creek Ecological Restoration Project. Today we are on our, what, fourth episode, third interview. Um, today we're going to talk with the local about using the trails, um, the benefit he gets from them, why he likes them, things like that. Um, so we're going to talk to someone that some people hate, many people love and appreciate, the great, the one and only the unique Scott Dammit. Hey, Scott, how's it going? Hey, Michael, pretty good. Thanks for having me. Cool. It's good to talk to you like this. So, um, as I said, we want to talk about our creek, the trails, the nature area, um, you know, get a personal view about using them and appreciate them and all that. So, can you tell folks about yourself? Uh, well, sure. I, uh, I guess I, I would start and say that, uh, you know, I've always loved nature. I've always loved bikes mm -hmm. and, uh, kind of came together for me in 2009, uh, when I started riding bike trails and really enjoying being around friends and, uh, riding with my brother and stuff like that. So, uh, it just kind of grew from there and, you know, you appreciate something for so long and then you, you kind of, feel the urge to give back and, and start to, you know, put, put back into the environment. Yeah. So, uh, started there and I started organizing, you know, what started out as, you know, trail work parties, um, builds and stuff like that, improving, you know, the land and, uh, maintaining it, uh, as we use it and then sort of developed into a, a social thing. And, uh, now it's kind of exploded. Um, in at least in this area where we have, you know, tons of people showing up for both work parties and group rides and, you know, all the local shops want to be a part of, you know, the movement that's going on. Cool. Yeah. It's just really sweet. exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I kind of know what you mean with some of that. Um, I was exercising, running trails, carrying logs on my shoulder and all this for a long time. Then it sounds like it's kind of the same. One day I'm out there and I'm all of a sudden like, wait. I'm a stranger to this place. I don't know this. I'm like, it's alien. I feel like an alien from some other planet. And so I started looking at foraging and tracking. And from there, of course, getting into zoology and botany and biology and ecology. And um, one thing leads to another. Pretty cool. Taking care of the area. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so for the last... I've been picking up trash out there for years, but been doing it seemingly every day for the last like two or three months. But um, how long is uh, now? What's the name of the bike group that you have? Cypress Creek MTB, uh, and we call it CCMTB for short. Yeah, and it's on Facebook. Uh, does it have a website? Yeah, we have uh, CCMTB.us, but really that's just a. Uh, to link you back to the Facebook group. It's where all the discussions and community activities occur. Cool. Where we have uh, the events for work parties and group rides. And um, we're, we're doing, uh, if I could cover some of that, we're doing mm -hmm. this coming Saturday, we're having REI come out uh, to demo their rental fleet. So uh, it won't cost the rider anything. They just show up with an ID and a, a, a means of securing a deposit like a credit card and uh, they'll let you ride the bike for free for you know 30 45 minutes you really get a good feel for the bike on some rough terrain and instead of just around the parking lot cool and they have their bikes for for rent um at, at the willowbrook store hmm. uh, so anyone can go nice. in there and check those out next saturday we're doing and for folks um, like who's this, sorry for folks who listen in the future today's december 5th um, so what, today's Friday? I forgot. Today's Thursday, December Thurs 5th, okay. 2019. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so December 7th, 2019, you're having the REI thing? Yep. And, and then, then next Saturday, December 14th, uh, we're having a work party where there's a, one of our, our hills, which all of our ground here is made up of basically sand. And sand doesn't hold too well together. There's no rocks involved. Uh, so uh, one of the hills that we ride has uh, eroded over the years, and we're going to go and put – we're actually going to put some rocks in there hmm. um, to 
hold it in place mm -hmm. and yeah. make it safe for everyone to enjoy. And that's an interesting thing for folks. Um, the reason we have sand here is because this was, um, like I think if I remember right, an alluvial plain um, for a washout from the glaciers from the Rocky Mountains and thereabouts. So it's like thousand, tens of thousands of years old. Um, and it's on top of some clay. It's about a quarter million. But what's a cool thing about our area that I find fascinating. But uh, cool. So um, any other upcoming events that folks might be interested in? Uh, on the 21st, we've got a uh, ugly sweater group ride. And that's a <laughs> beginner-friendly, no-drop uh, group ride. So uh, everyone's welcome, especially kids. Uh, hopefully yeah. it will be um, cool enough to keep your sweater on. And uh, at least we hope so. Uh, hope to have a good time. Uh, we'll probably have some snacks and refreshments after the event and, uh, you know, just kind of hang out with everybody and enjoy the enjoy the weather while we have it this cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Hopefully some folks in some other cities might hear this, too. And um, I know in other cities they already have some stuff like this. Maybe some people can have some new things, new groups um, that take care of the trails, enjoy them, take care of nature, um, have good rules of the road have a lot of these social events as you do like it's nice to see people out there biking um because yeah on the facebook group people announce when they're going to go on rides and get together right yeah for sure um and there's there's a lot of community stuff involved there too we've, we've kind of loosened the reins a little bit to where we're, we're allowing people to ask for like hey is anyone in the community providing a certain service like does anyone do sheetrock and so we're we're kind of allowing that little mini mini community to develop and, and become stronger. So it's not just folks with bikes. It's not just folks who walk the trails, but it's also neighbors and friends and, you know, folks that, uh, you know, really want to get involved in a community uh, in an online space. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, it's a nice group from what I've heard. Um, I haven't witnessed it myself because I haven't been on some of these others, but I've heard that the bikers – around here generally are better at being friendly, following the rules of the road, yelling biker, whereas even in Houston, I think from what I heard, some other places that uh, they don't do that. So that's a nice thing about this area. Polite, friendly, courteous, share the trails, enjoy and share. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's challenges at every trail around town, um, but I think that we, we really have a good grasp on just, you know, being nice to people and realizing that, like, you know, this is – Although we have worked very hard to, to build up and improve what we have so far, uh, and we definitely make it a better place for everyone, uh, we have no ownership to the trails, and mm -hmm. we are just one user group. So we really try, first of all, to, to share with everyone um, and to respect the, the right of way that uh, walkers and, and horses have. Uh, yeah. And dog walkers and, and such like that. So those are the folks that are, you know, really driving um you know, the courtesy between the, the trail groups. And I think that you, you hit it spot on where some other other areas of town maybe don't have that, uh, you know, that relationship. Yeah, unfortunately. But we, yeah. We, work, we work hard for that. Yeah. And then um, it's, it's good to have that relationship and then people can work together. So we might be have some people that walk their dogs or just walk and they might come out for some um, trail work and – I mean, in a sense, kind of they should, so to speak, because it's helping take care of the trails, and a lot of the trails wouldn't be there if it weren't for y'all. So, you know, horse people should get out and help, um, walkers, other than that. Yeah. yeah, and that's, that's really kind of how we got started, too. After, I think it was Ike, um, hmm. a lot of trees were falling down. When was uh, Ike? Or had fallen what, down. What year was that? Uh, I'd have to look that up, but it was, <laughs> I would to. say, <laughs> keep talking and I'll look it up. I, I know that, yeah, I know that I, I started uh, doing more work and fixing, you know, st trails up and stuff around 2011. Okay. This is, it was and, 2008. Uh, around, around that time. Sorry. It was 2008 hurricane night. Okay. And I know that after 2008, we had a huge drought right after that. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was bad. With with all the trees that had fallen by by the time I came around, you know these trails were basically just uh, ignored, um, hmm. and they had a pretty derogatory nickname, which I'm not going to repeat. But uh, <laughs> you know, 
you know, it wasn't exactly, you know, a destination spot. So oh, it would have been, I, would have been better for me, though. Like, for someone like me who likes to run the trails <laughs> and exercise, man, that would have been like a, a, a heaven. Jumping oh, over yeah. trees and all this especially, stuff. Yeah. Especially with the, yeah, with the move nap stuff that you do. Like, it, it, it was <laughs> really like an obstacle course. Yeah. Um, so many fallen trees. Um, Either way. And I started yeah. around... Yeah, I started around 2011 um, organizing, you know, folks, uh, getting people together. And, and then in, in 2012, we created the Facebook group, which has just mm. been, you know, an outpouring of support and, and uh, really has grown to be one of the, the biggest MTB uh, online communities uh, around town. So it's, cool. it's uh, very rewarding to see that grow uh, and knowing that, you know, we can call upon those folks to come out and help at a moment's notice or, you know, we try to give everybody a couple of weeks so that they can plan mm-hmm. ahead and make sure to, to attend. But sometimes, you know, I might just need, you know, one or two people to help out. And it's always nice to be able to reach out and have someone show up. Yeah. 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 I'd like to get out there some, and, but uh, sometimes I'm busy farmer's market. Then I'm focusing on this trash stuff. So, yeah, but, and another thing I'd, I'd like to mention is that, uh, you know, we support you know, a lot of the trail features that we build and, and fix. Uh, they do require cost. They require materials. They require yeah. logistics to get the materials on site. They require lots of tools. Uh, we, we raise funds by selling T-shirts, stickers, hats, uh, jerseys, any any number of things. We actually have some power bank batteries right now that, that we're selling. So those are all available on the Facebook group. Cool. Yeah. We have, uh, we're set up for, for, uh, you know, Zelle, PayPal, and all that good stuff. And I'll put a link in the show notes to the Facebook group so folks can find it easier. Um, and then you welcome, not everyone who joins is to be like a bicycler, right? Absolutely not. It's, it's there for everyone. You know, neighbors, walkers, dog walkers, joggers, you know, it's just a, just a spot where we can all meet up. Yeah. It's a good place for people to see, okay. Um, it's not just bikers, but what's going on to take care of the trails? How can I help? Um, anybody can help right. out, take care of the trails. That's a good thing. Or socialize, have a barbecue. Like, okay, I'm going to meet some bikers in the area that I see when I'm walking my dog. So, hey, I'm going to like host a barbecue or something. Yeah, mm-hmm. we also post up all the events. Uh, we create events for all of the work days and uh, most of the big group ride uh, scheduled events in the events tab. Uh, so folks can know when those are coming. Uh, we usually promote them pretty heavily in the days leading up to the work parties just to let everybody know because mm-hmm. just the way that the Facebook lo- logarithm acts, it doesn't uh, allow everyone to see everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Continually yeah. promote it and, you know, put it in everyone's feed so they can see when it comes. And um, so, yeah, we got um, – Bicyclers out there, people who walk, people who run, people who walk their dogs. Oh, and I've even seen at one time a family who walked their cat. That was awesome. Maybe, I think after Harvey, I haven't seen them, so maybe they moved after Hurricane Harvey. But um, it was like a family of four, you know, mother, father, I think two kids, if I remember right, maybe son and daughter. And they had a cat that would walk along with them, um, just follow them. That was pretty cool. I wish I would have taken a picture or something. That to me is like one of the greatest things about the trails is that it's how it brings families together. Realizing the folks that that live nearby, they have such a great amenity. Um, You know, we don't, we don't build anything that can't be walked over. Uh, There's always a bypass for, for everything, even for the beginner riders. Mm -hmm. Um, But once again, like we, we mentioned about the, you know, the common courtesy we have towards everybody that uses the trails. Or at least we try to. That's not going to be a hundred percent of us, you know. There's jerks oh, yeah. in every yeah. every that's group what, of people. That's so. one thing I was going to point out. Yeah, uh, yeah. And but then yeah, we we definitely want to get everybody involved. And I just one of the mo- main motivating factors for me in working on the trails is to help seeing seeing families together and enjoying nature together and seeing the, the parents teach the kids and watching those big bright eyes, you know, when they're meeting people or see people's pets or you know, see wildlife out there. It's just amazing. Yeah. And then really quickly, I don't like, it's a kind of hate to say it because it's such a great topic, but before we go on, I want to say, yeah, like 
there's people who who bike out there who weren't associated with CCMTB, and some of them can be jerks. And in every group, as you say, most CCMTBers are great, but of course there are some jerks like in any other group. And um, same thing with some walkers or some runners. And I know there's um, one guy or two out there who's like really, really weird and does things around seven in the morning that he should keep to himself. But uh, <laughs> yeah. okay, hopefully, the yeah. Police... There's there's all types, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, there ha- there has been have been a few cases, isolated cases of <clears throat> someone, you know, showing too much of themselves. Uh, there have been, you know, but we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a uh, a lot of people that are also out on the trails. Yeah, it's not uh, it's not a dangerous place to be. There's a lot of your your neighbors and you know other folks in the community, you know, most of the mountain bikers are, are definitely, you know, the kind of stand up and defend, you know, uh, our, our fellow trail users. Very much. And that's another but, reason to, uh, to be on the group. So, you know, some of them personally, so you can say hi, you can call them. Hey, I'm out here. I need some help. Um, cause... Yeah. And, you know, I, I've been in that situation before. I, I, I wrecked my bike pretty bad one time. Uh, I got bit by a dog another time. We were wow. actually in the middle of the road trying to rescue the dog, and, and uh, it got scared and, and bit me, um, oh. and I needed some help. Uh, needed some, But it was it was great to have a, a resource to ask somebody to come out and help. But, uh, yeah, true. Mm-hmm. I think for the most part, you know, we, we try to keep it pretty safe just because we have, you know, the volume of people out there, you know, the neighbors, the bike riders. There's almost always somebody out there riding. Um you know, mm-hmm. and if if, uh, if someone needs help, you know, we'll definitely make a call or, or have, have someone come out and help. Um, one thing that uh, new trail users might notice uh, as they're going down the trails that uh, at the very beginning of most of the trail heads, mm. we have a, a post in the ground with the trail name on it. Um, so if, if something does happen down that trail, um, oh, yeah. it would that would be one easy way that emergency services could would know how to reach you where you are. Very good so point. Please take note of the, those trail names. Then yeah, everybody who uses the trails should know about CCMTB because you got a map of the trails and you got names of them, so they can see where they are, what the name of the trail is, describe their position to a person or to emergency personnel. So there's a couple of ways. First of all, yeah, there's a map up at the kiosk at, at the parking lot that's on uh, what, the end of West Cypress Forest. Um, the other the other thing is I do have printed out maps that I pass out with, you know, more information about our parent organization, GORBA, Greater Houston Off-Road Bike Association, um, and how they help us um, get the funds for the trail features and stuff that we build out there. Uh, so I pass those out pretty frequently. If I see somebody new or if I see somebody looking at the map on the kiosk, I'll go ahead and give them one. And then the other way folks can find their way around is through uh, several different fitness tracking apps like uh, MTB yeah. Project or Trail Run Project. Or um, my particular favorite is Trail Forks hmm. uh, because Trail Forks will actually show you the map, show you the name of the trail that you're on, hmm, cool. show you where you've been, and then show you how to get back if you if you're if you're not if you don't know where you are. And what are those three again that you mentioned? I'll put them in the show notes for folks. The Trail Run Project, MTB Project, and Trail Fork. Okay, Trail Forks. Got it. Cool. And I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the more people are out there, the more eyes and the less weirdos. Um, we can keep an eye on it for each other and keep it safe and law-abiding and um, absolutely everything. Um and then, you know, have a cell phone with you so you can call or take pictures of video or something you need to. Here's my leg or here's a weirdo or whatever and send it in. <laughs> sure. And have a local... And then one other thing. Yeah, one other thing just in, in line with everybody staying safe out there is just to make sure uh, that um, when you're when you're out enjoying the trails, either running or riding or whatever you'd like to do, just keep um, – make sure that you can hear your – your environment. Um, oh, true. Yeah. Someone yeah, yeah. wants to pass you or, I mean, I know it's, it's great to have, you know, the modern technology of headphones and listening, streaming your music through your phone and all that. Um, it, it is, 
a good thing to add to the environment, but just make sure that you're aware of your surroundings. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, runners and joggers where I've been able to sneak right up on them um, and as I'm trying to pass, and uh, they just, you know, I wish everybody was just a little bit more aware. Yeah, it's around. happened to me. I'm out running, and I'm there's someone walking up ahead or running, and I'm like, coming on your left, and they don't do anything. Come on your left, <laughs> and, and then you go right. by them, and they're surprised, and they're scared. It's like... Um, and if you, if you want to listen to music or something, use one earpiece, leave the other out so you can hear. Um, yeah, I actually really like, uh, you know, some of these uh, folks have, or some of these new headphones are these bone induction earphones and they just, they don't cover your ears so you can still hear everything oh, outside. Cool. Huh. Uh, but they're kind of expensive. So given what we have to work with, either leave one out or have the volume low enough to where you can hear someone call out to you. And my recommendation is just don't use them at all. We need more quiet. If you look into the scientific literature, quiet is very, the very birds. important. Yeah, and listen to nature. Absolutely, and I, I really love the sound of the forest, the, yeah. the birds, the squirrels. You know, it's just, uh, it, it, it adds a layer of, you know, relaxation for me and therapy as well. It lets you be real. It lets you focus on, learn to focus on your surroundings, learn to get the information implicit in the sounds or the quiet and the shadows and the landscape when you got the headphones on and live in the moment. Yeah. Um, you gotta be Focus real on the moment. And then if you pay more attention to that stuff, it'll help you in other situations where you're in a crowd of people. Cause as like Steve Irwin Absolutely. said, Steve Irwin said like in crocodile, like, Oh, one movie he was in, I forgot. Um, he and his wife, he said, um, a sentiment I agree with. <laughs> I had said it before, and I'm glad to him, hear him say it. He said uh, he'd rather be around wild animals than he would around, like, many people. You know, some people <laughs> oh, are absolutely. great, but, you know, um, it's people, not animals, that came up with the Holocaust and World War II and blah, 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 and, you know. So, right. uh, um, not to knock people, but just to knock too many we've had in history, unfortunately. But, um, so, and then, yeah, like, I think runners and dog walkers and horseback riders, too, would be good to yell out, like, runner, walker, dog, um, horse rider or whatever, just horse coming around corners, so people walking or people on bikes can know. It shouldn't just be the bikers that are calling out. Yeah, and, that, and you know, just to add one more thing about, you know, knowing what's around your environment, I, I, you know, when you have, you talk about these large animals like a, a horse or something, I've never snuck up on a horse or never had a horse sneak up on me because I, you could, if you're really paying attention, you can smell them. Oh, yeah. I wow, saw nice. a, uh, hmm. I saw a big old, probably a 14 point buck one very early one morning uh, a couple of years ago. And wow. I could, I could smell him for about, you know, 500 yards. Wow, and interesting. And hmm. I, tell, I tell you, I'm glad I was moving when I saw him because I didn't know at that point, like, I'm sure I kind of caught him by surprise, and I wasn't sure if he was going to charge me or just stand there, but he was just beautiful and majestic, and it was just, you know, wow. just a, a, a spirit of the forest. It was just an amazing experience. But, yeah, I'm glad I was moving because uh, that, that really, uh, I think, helped him make his decision that he didn't have to chase me because I was already moving away. Cool. And that was 14, pu 14 point buck in our area? Yes. Wow. As a matter of fact, it was on what we call the connector trail right underneath the uh, the railroad tracks. Huh. Wow. Huge, huge buck. Nice. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, I love that we got that in our area. That's that's like a benefit. I know someone who used to live along Cypress Creek, and he's in Cypress, and he's moved to a different part of town. I don't think he's been in some other cities, and he says that... Um, nowhere else in Houston do you have what we have along Cypress Creek, that kind of nature and wildlife, and he thinks it's like maybe even not in any other city. Um, that yeah, aware. and that's man, that's that's got to be the number one reason that you know I've I've lived in Houston all my life, and I've I've experienced just about every part of town that that's out there, and I just always lo love that about Cypress because. We're right on the edge of civilization. We've got all the shopping and convenience amenities, but there's also a bit of country. There's yeah. a lot of green spaces. 
you know, there's, there's pastures and what I think of like a lot of homegrown businesses, um, you know, there's nowhere else really that, you know, like Sugarland is great, but it seems like everything there is franchised and fabricated and manufactured, Mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and a lot of other parts of town are like that, you know, whereas I think Cyprus is unique because it it Mm -hmm. has this old town history. You have the, you know, the railroad that came through here for so many years, um, you have so many beautiful green spaces. Body Land uh, Conservancy has uh, three three different preserves just in the Cypress area. They have the hundred acre wood. They have a little Creek preserve, and there's another one that I don't think has a name behind uh, the little Cypress Creek preserve on the other side of the the creek. Um, but there's just tons of amenities here you know without really sacrificing you know you can still run to home depot in 10 minutes and <laughs> yeah. just you know there's there's farm pastures just on the other side you know what i mean it's just yeah a, a really great um area and i think that most of the i think most of the people that live here no matter how long they live here kind of kind of get that feel for it you know it's got that small town feel yeah and just the abundance of nature that's very close to to all these uh mass-produced neighborhoods it's it's still like makes me feel like I'm, you know, in in the country, or yeah. or in an older time. Yeah, I love having the nature there. Um, right nearby, you can get out, and I can go places where I don't see anybody for hours, and it's like no road traffic or anything. Um, sometimes no airplanes, just totally quiet. And finding that kind of thing outdoors in nature is like um, hard in this kind of urban city environment um most anywhere i think yeah it's it's definitely difficult and 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 you know i've traveled all over the country doing you know either for business or for mm-hmm. riding bikes or for mm-hmm. whatever vacations and there's just not another place that's quite as urban but also as country as, as mm-hmm. is. And Interesting. I like the way that is yeah so we ought to take care of it <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, everyone that we get involved in, you know, that's why a lot of the reason why I work so hard, um, not only on the trails, but to promote the trails is just that, you know, understanding the more people that we have that are interested in these areas and understand their value and understand the value of the ecology that, that survives there uh, will be more people that we can use to, to protect this place. Yeah, right. And keep, keep those, you know, keep those green spaces available for the generations to yeah, that's one thing why I started like uh, CCERP. I've liked, as I said, I've been out here for years and picked up trash, but I finally submitted and yielded to the fact that um, I can't clean up the whole creek myself and I'm not going to be around forever and I love it so much that I'd like other people to take care of it when like uh, I'm gone, right. you know? Right, right. Well, and, and in a lot of senses, that's very similar to how CCMTD got started, you know? Cool. It was basically a, a few of us that were just out on our own time doing a little work here and there, make me, maybe make a jump or dig some drainage or something like that. Um, and it became, you know, we'd start to see each other's work, and, and a few <laughs> yeah. of us met, you know, would you like or, leave your initials with the chainsaw? You cut down a tree. <laughs> you did S D. No, you just. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just come around a you just come around a corner and oh, there's a new berm there, or or you know you you come across an area and oh, someone trimmed that tree, uh, and you know we just started interacting together more and meeting each other on the trails and hey, I had this idea and starting to work together, um, and then um, we created a it probably was was like that for maybe a year or two. And then we created CCMTB. Um, and really the goal there was we need to get all our voices together in one place. We need yeah. to get all our advocates that, you know, everybody that enjoys this place, we need to team up together mm-hmm. because some changes were happening. You know, Biolane Conservancy was, was taken over the area now known as the hundred acre wood. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, there was, uh, there was, activity from you know the county there was activity from t4 parks and there was activity from flood control and there were all these different you know entities that were trying to shape what was going to happen uh, to this area and we wanted to be one of those entities and so 
we teamed up first with, with BLC. We got uh, helped them to understand what we did and what we were about. Cool. And and how and integrated Gorba into it and, and explained to them that we had, you know, standards and ways that, and methods and funding to, to do uh, the things that we wanted to do, which helped us, you know, develop that relationship. Um, and then with a certain amount of time, we were able to get, you know, the landowner parties to agree that these trails are an amenity and that they agreed with the, the way and the manner in which we maintained them and the stuff that we worked on. And so we went from being basically completely just an ignored piece of, you know, space to bringing it into like a sanctioned, uh, sanctioned by the county, sanctioned by Bioland Conservancy amenity for the community. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and, it, and it's become, yeah, it's become really, um, it's become really like a destination for people all around Houston. Mm hmm. Yeah, I love and, these trails. And the whole, whole, yeah, the whole start of that was just the concept that many hands do light, do more work, mm -hmm. and you know, we could get a lot more work done with with team effort than we could ever hope to imagine by ourselves. Yeah, I love that the trails are natural, dirt, no asphalt, no concrete, no rubber tires chopped up. Um, it's beautiful. Um, you know, keeps it real. Yeah, we we. Yeah, we always wanted to maintain natural materials. Um, there is some, there are some wood features, mm -hmm. uh, lumber features, I, I should say, uh, just because of the availability and the, the feasibility to do something out of out of wood is a lot easier than, you know, if we were to go uh, buy raw wood and, and have it done that way. Yeah, um, and like you need it for like more bridge. I mean, there'd be no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the bikers would have to yeah. ride through like sand at the bottom of a like ravine um <laughs> to make it through there and, well before we yeah. built that bridge you know people just rode all the way down to the end end of yeah. the spillway and came back yeah so. and we saw an opportunity for something exciting yeah. and so we went ahead and planned it mapped it and you know all all that was history and yeah that's a nice feature and while we're on that that pink diamond forgot some of the others but uh if people get on ccmtb and ask about the um level of some of those it'd be very helpful so you don't get hurt or look at the color of the signs because we talked about the names of the trails but absolutely what are the colors that you have to mark trails and what do the colors mean uh yeah that's a good question so basically it's it's based upon the same concept as how they rate ski trails and, cool. and imba does the same thing so a green trail means that it's going to be um, flat it can be wider very easy um, no challenge or no features uh, so on a green trail we may still have some features but they will either be off to the side or there will be a bypass so we still consider that a green um, the blue trail is going to be something that has some more technical features. Probably it's, most of the blue trails you have to, you know, there's a, a significant amount of climbing. Um, so it's not flat. Um, most of those still do have a bypass, but um, we consider them uh, a green or I'm sorry, we consider those more intermediate trails a blue. Mm -hmm. Now there are a couple of features um, in our trails that would be con that we consider black. Hmm. Uh, black consideration means no bypass. It's a very technical feature. Um, it requires a, a significant amount of skill in order to overcome. Uh, and so we like to put those warnings up so that folks uh, understand what the risk is. What are the different um, colors? So folks can understand the yeah. Go ahead, green, sorry. blue, and black. Okay, just those three? No pink or red or yeah. anything? Okay. All right, sorry, go ahead. No, uh, pink, pink Diamond is kind of a joke because uh, <laughs> it seems like every trail around the Houston area has something called Black Diamond, and they never ah. live up to the rating. Ah. Uh, okay. So oh, we kind of made a joke about, okay, it's not it's not a black feature, but let's say it's a dark blue, but we're just going <laughs> to call it Pink Diamond to, to make a joke out of it. That's funny. Because uh, it's, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But... Um, 
folks do want to be careful and take some of that seriously. I think for most people, because of how PE is in school and the gym and everyday life, they've lost contact with risk assessment. Um, and learning risk assessment is a very important reason to get out, especially for kids. They learn what they're capable of and what they're not. They learn confidence, very important, but be careful because if you're not ready for some of this stuff, you can get hurt and it's happened. Like haven't, I think one person on Moore Bridge, if I remember right, some runner, older guy, I think he broke his leg there and some lady, it might've been Pink Diamond around there, was out bicycling with her kids and I think she fell and broke her leg, had to have EMS get out there on four wheelers. And... Yeah, a number, yeah, a number of incidents have happened, uh, folks on bikes and not on bikes. Um, and, and it's unfortunate, but it is a part of, you know, uh, being outside and, and taking those risks. And you bring up a good point about folks need to make sure to assess that risk ahead of time. Uh, every single one of the features that are, that are out there are completely walkable. Um, sometimes there's a there's a bypass that may be a little bit longer, um, but the other thing to consider is especially early in the morning when the dew is out that some of those wooden features will be could be slick, mm -hmm. and uh, have to take that into consideration before you know transversing any of those. Yeah, and then it's overall still safer than driving in your car. Um, I'd rather be out there on the trails Absolutely. running around than like because um, on the trail you know what's going to happen and you're in control. On the road. You never know what's going to hit you, what's going to run a stoplight, what kind of craziness is next to you. All kinds of things can happen that change Absolutely. you forever beyond a broken leg. So much safer. And um, as I say, you're learning how to control risk. And people ought to think, um, don't you, it's not, not like walking or doing nothing versus doing this dangerous thing. Do logical progressions. Give yourself time to do easier features and build up. Think about what you can do to prepare for the more difficult thing, like ride your bicycle. Um, if you want to get into a jump, jump like three inches, jump six inches, see how it feels, work it out, get up to a foot, build up to two or three feet, um, but do it slow and smart. Don't just do it out of nowhere without preparation and get hurt. Um, logical progressions matter. It's yeah, like, that's... Go ahead. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. I usually recommend folks, and almost all of our jumps are rollable. Uh, there are there are some that don't yet have landings, and and that's typically part of the process is to build the jump part of it, see where riders are landing, and then start to build up that that landing. Uh, oh yeah. Make, hmm. And a lot of times we just make everything rollable. So even if you don't want to jump, you can roll over it. Uh, but you always want to check and make sure beforehand, make sure that there's a landing there for you. Um, and then a lot of times what I tell people is just to, to roll it at first and then just gradually go just a little bit faster and faster as your comfort and confidence build. Um, and then, you know, pretty soon you'll be landing on the backside. And uh, it just feels feels great when you hit a jump just right and your tires just smoothly hit the landing and it shoots you just a little bit faster and like it just feels great to be in the air and um, <laughs> yeah that's speaking from personal experience at least and same thing with the incline declines going through the ditches some people um as i say they've broken their leg there and i know there have been an, a few times where i've had to save someone um or i've seen someone fall even two or three days ago i was out and someone went down an incline and up an incline and fell over um thankfully he seemed to roll out of it pretty well. Um, so I told him, good fall. And at first he didn't understand it. So I just say, no, I don't mean the fall, I mean the way you rolled. That was good. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But, uh, and that's the important thing. I think I think people get hurt when they try to hold on to it too long or try to keep from falling. And I think really what, what folks should do is aim, aim for where they want to land and how they want to land and, and, you know, try for the most part to get untangled from the bike. Mm -hmm. um, or untangled from any any roots or anything like that, and and you know obviously try to land on your butt so you don't hit your head and things like that. Uh, a lot of the a lot of those blue trails that that re require a lot of climbing that go up and down a lot. 
they those can be navigated pretty easily if the person has enough confidence to allow the speed roll through the you know the bottom, uh, and then it'll propel you most of the way through the through the the climb. Yeah. And so, so you know that's just one of those confidence building things. Um, I've taught many people, you know, what we typically do on the group rides is when we encounter one of those features, you know, I'll, I'll be the leader and I'll run through, you know, I'll show everybody how to do it. And then I put my bike down and I go stand by it to help people that maybe don't make it quite all the way up mm, yeah. and catch them, keep them from falling cool. like, like more bridge friends. Yeah. So yeah, it's something where people can do logical progressions, do a, shallower kind of bull so to speak don't do a steeper decline and incline do shallower do small because you got to get used to how it feels what the experience is how fast you need to be going the torque on the how bike to balance yourself on the bike yeah there's, the better there's work balance yeah thanks yeah so so many different things you know to think about when you're doing something like that and that's that's another one of the great things about the trail is that like we have sort of like we have shorter ones. We have some hills that are only two or three feet. We have some that are six and some that are, you know, 15. And, and it just, you, you get like a really good um, diversity of, of being able to step your skill level up. So yeah. there's some small things you can try at first. And there's larger and, you know, more confidence building things. Uh, and more of that is to come. Good. We're going to do something um, called a, a skinny which is basically just a long balance beam board hmm. um, that, that, and it'll be very, very low to the ground. So there's not really a lot of, uh, uh, not really a lot, a lot of punishment when you fall. Um, mm -hmm. You just, you know, step off the bike, uh, it, but helps you practice balance and helps you keep, keep straight on that line. And, you know, it's a, it's a skill that all of us need, uh, no matter what level we'll all use it. Yeah. Yeah. And like one thing um, I like to tell people, as I say, I do move net, teach people that. But uh, um, one person I know, um, I don't know, I don't remember how old she was, 12, 15. She was dared to jump off a 12-foot wall, and so she did. And then she was in the hospital for three weeks. Um, not very smart. Ouch. Yeah. Um, but if she had been trained, it would have been perfectly fine, and she could have done it. Like some people can jump off, off a 12 foot wall more safely than a lot of people can walk down the street or down the stairs, but you got to do those slow Absolutely. logical progressions and be patient and disciplined and know that you're like everyone else. It's a cause effect process. You got to go through to get mastery. Just like coach summer, an Olympic um, gymnastics coach. He makes his people do like three month segments and um, some of them, his athletes, might be begging to go on. I got this down. This is boring. I'm going to go on. And he knows that it's only when they're finally bored with it that they have it down so well that they can go on. And he knows it takes time for mastery. Like, you should be able to go through something 100 or 500 times so it sinks into your nervous system and your brain and becomes second nature. And then you're ready to move on to something more difficult because if you – don't have down right. like a six inch thing trying to push it to one foot you're like not ready for it you don't got the habits set in your whole nervous system and your reactions and your balance and everything so go slow like the girl should have done roll on the ground jump from a foot up jump from two feet jump from five feet 500 times jump from seven feet 500 times then finally get up to 12. same thing with the bicycling um we need to like discipline ourselves and train, um, and that'll help like teach our children better. So, you know, stuff we can use in all kinds of different areas of life. Yeah, so. you literally have to learn before you can walk. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so they're great trails. We just got to make sure we know how to use them, just like uh, using a knife. Maybe you don't want a kid to use a sharp knife. You wait till they're a little more older and responsible and can do things, and then uh, you practice and Absolutely. you know become a chef. And you can do all. <laughs> or some chefs, you know, they're like tossing the knives hand to hand and chopping stuff up, and it just takes practice. Absolutely. How long have you been out here in this area? Like 
Sorry, what? Go ahead. Uh, I moved in. No, no, no. It's it's fine. Uh, I I moved in in uh, 2004. It was about two years after I got out of the Marine Corps. Oh, cool. And uh, I've I've never really wanted to live anywhere else since I moved here. Mm. Yeah, I've thought about it at one time, but um, after I started getting out on these trails and learning <laughs> what I had and appreciating them and falling in love with them, it's like, yeah. uh, I don't think I want to move anywhere else. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Um, what kind of changes have you seen through the years in the trails in the area? Well, in the area specifically, I would I would say sadly that you know there's a lot fewer green spaces. Hmm. You know, um, I, it seems like almost every week I'm seeing you know a patch of woods getting torn down to build a shopping center or apartment complex or yeah, it's too bad a business that'll go out of business and, eventually. Uh, I, yeah, and I just wish, you know, and at the same time, you still see, like, a, a lot of vacant business areas, and you just wish that people would, uh, you know, use what we have and, and try to make it work. Uh, eventually, mm -hmm. you know, we'll probably be, you know, more like uh, Europe, where there's not really any uh, green spaces except parks, and uh, it seems kind of sad to me. Yeah, very. You know, yeah. but... Uh, I wish I had a bunch of money so on I could the other... buy up a bunch of land. I wish I wish I was a billionaire so I could buy oh, up yeah. all the land along Cypress Creek, like 100 to 200 yards out, and just keep it natural and allow people to go on it. That'd be well, beautiful. Well, that's, that's actually one of the missions of uh, Bayou Land Conservancy is, is cool. they're, they're out there acquiring these pieces of property that, you know, have, have a creek or bayou waterfront so that they can, um, you know, protect the water quality. Um, mm. And protect the green spaces that are that are close to the waterways. Yeah. So they have they have preserves along Cypress Creek, Little Cypress Creek, Greens Bayou. Um, they have several down. They have a big one in Deer Park down south, which is a, mm. a prairie, the Deer Park Prairie. Oh, nice. Mm. Uh, so they, yeah, they have like um, stuff along Spring Creek. They they're the 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 anchor sponsor of the the green green belt trails up there, and so interconnecting all of these waterway spaces, you know, along the creek, along all the creeks. And then, yeah, folks, like, when you get out, then you see what's out there, and you appreciate it more, like, um, they might just think it's some, like, academic um, water quality thing we're talking about, but um, people take their dogs out there to swim in it and drink it. That's important. There's There are fish in there. We got mussels and clam out there. We actually have, like, freshwater shrimp. I didn't know that until I found a little tide pool left after Hurricane Harvey. And when it dried up, I found this, like, I don't know, half inch long or so inch long, like, little thing and took a picture. And it was identified on iNaturalist for me as a freshwater shrimp. So they were, like, out here, huh. too. And then we, we got the... Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah, now that I thought about that, I'll put, like, a link in the show notes. Um, I'll have to look that up on my uh iNaturalist thing put a link to that um so folks can see if they're interested but then we got deer drinking in the water and going in the water coon um possum um beaver there's, there's deer. fox out there i've yeah. seen evidence of fox and yeah and beaver too. um I interestingly enough that the beaver where they were finding a decline in population has actually had a resurgence. Um, Sweet. There's several places along the creek um, and in some of the detention areas where, you know, there's evidence of new beaver populations, you know, growing and, and mating and, and uh, really uh, coming back. So it's, it's really encouraging to see stuff like that. And then if folks look on the uh, CCERP page on Facebook, you can do a search. I've got some links in there about the importance of beavers. I'll be putting others up. You can search on the internet. Um, it's like some people are finding out how it's they're really important and they help farmers. Um, some people are doing research and some farmers think like the beavers are bad, but then they find out the benefits they get from having beavers around and then they're just instantly sold because it, um, you know, because naturally enough, if it's an in interest in the ecology, it's going to be in the best interest of them because for their farms, they need the geology and ecology. And without that stuff, their farm doesn't exist. So um, they're very beneficial animals. But 
Yeah, yeah and another beneficial animal, just hearing you say that, it kind of reminds me of, you know, the, the bee situation that we have currently, you know, trying to encourage more pollinators because they really are the root of, you know, the, the forest ecology and, and trying to help them. And in fact, we just built yesterday a, a bee habitat, a cool. uh, native bee poll pollinating bee habitat. Um, oh, through, nice idea. Um, our most recent Eagle Scout project. Cool. Uh, we put that in last night on the hundred acre wood. So we're oh, nice. we're pushing forward for, you know, trying trying to help, you know, uh help nature, you know, flourish in these yeah. green spaces that we have left. Yeah. You know, with all of the with all of the construction and all the clear cutting that we've seen, you know, uh we need to make sure that the, the animals can find their way back to the safe places like the hundred acre wood and, and some of these other areas that, you know, we're, we're trying to protect to, to keep them safe. And then folks can listen to, uh, episodes two and three. Um, episode two, I talked to Jim Fordyce, a professor of ecology at the university of Tennessee. Um, that was a very interesting discussion. Um, talk. And then in the third episode talk to um mark merriweather forty brigham we bring up some issues like that um some ideas folks can just do in their own backyard like plant certain things to attract the insects and bees and in some places don't rake up the leaves leave them there because that's habitat for some insects which we must you know we need to survive like if you like birds well the birds ain't going to be there unless they have something to eat they need insects and stuff and berries so if we leave some of them little micro habitats there, plant some things that they need, the birds and the insects, then um, it's good for them and it's good for us. Good all around. Absolutely. But, but uh, yeah, so that's another thing that um, y'all are involved in. Um, Eagle Scouts do projects to uh, build bridges. I mean, like, not building bridges metaphorically, but actually building bridges on the trails. And uh, Technic technically, they're they're boardwalks, um, and and we just yeah, we yeah. just built one of those this past weekend as well because um, they're very close to the ground. And basically, what they do is, you know, there is uh, inside the hundred acre wood there are some what they call delineated wetlands, um, which are identified by Army Corps of Engineers as hmm. being, you know, a a delicate ecology that needs to be protected. So there's specific rules going into how we can still appreciate those areas. Um, one thing we're not allowed to put things into the ground to recover a mud hole, a hole that's become, you know, muddy. We're not allowed to put things into the ground there. Hmm, mm -hmm. um, we are allowed to bury posts and build boardwalks that go over it. So that's what we do typically. Um, and that's, uh, we've got probably, probably close to a thousand feet of, of, um, of boardwalk, um, with the whole trail system, considering several of the ones that we built off the preserve and all the ones that we've coordinated with scouts to build those on the preserve. Cool. Yeah. It's one good thing about CCMTV and Scott and Mark and the others that run it. Um, nice folks keep things good. I know you, um, are diligent and like, conscientious about talking to the county and people of the land and making sure you're doing what you can and not doing what you shouldn't things like that um right so then if folks um if you have an idea about what you want to do to the trail don't do it you need to like get in touch with scott and some others and see what's allowable out there or what's not like we want to keep for example um at least i think 80 percent of the land uh, without a trail, maybe 20% trail, 80% without, so that the, um, you know, the trees and but, wildlife. The deer, for one place. thing, you know, the wildlife yeah. need places and, yeah. and sanctuaries where they can be undisturbed. And, yeah. you know, that's that's good for everyone. Now, they still yeah. interact on the trails and they still, you know, come around. You still see, you know, animals on the trails and stuff. But they definitely need, like the deer, for instance, they need, you know, a place to bed down. Um, yeah, and that's and another that's, reason to call out. That's biker. not going to be. Yeah, another reason. I like to ring a bell because yeah, that's, that's, that's like an unnatural sound oh, yeah, to right. them. Yeah. Um, 
So keep squirrels away. I've, I've heard stories of squirrels getting caught in bike wheels, and um, it's not wow. good for anybody involved. So whenever I see a squirrel, I always just ring my bell, cool. um, and they always jump away because they, they recognize that is not a sound that they want to be close to. Oh, cool. That's one of the more helpful things that I use. Um, okay. Yeah, that's good. But, yeah, we we definitely need to, you know, uh, make sure that we're not over over – uh, what we call trail density. Um, there's just a, a right balance between appreciating, you know, the woods and having so much overlap that there's, you know, I th- we think, I think right now we have a pretty good trail system as far as, you know, reaching all of the different little scenes that we have. There's some swamp mm-hmm. scenes that I just, I find incredibly beautiful and the different types of plants and, and animals that, that exist there. Um, and then, you know, we have some that are, you know, um, more foresty that, uh, you know, really, really thick, you know, yopons and, you know, mm-hmm. lots of thick oak trees and lots of pine trees and, and other areas like that where, um, then we have a couple of overlook spots. So I think mm-hmm. that in general, we have a, a good level of diversity with the trails and appreciating all this stuff. Um, mm-hmm. and, and obviously there's, there's always someone that wants to, build something, change something, add something. Um, we, and we can accommodate most of those things as long as they don't prevent everybody else from appreciating it. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, there's not going to be any motocross jump, uh, <laughs> just simply because motorized vehicles aren't allowed on the trails yeah. um, by, by anyone. Um, and, uh, you know, but if, if folks want to, you know, Hey, uh, build a, some riders want to build a berm in some places. We can definitely accommodate that because it doesn't get in anybody else's way. Yeah. And no one else, you know, uh, may might use it, but no one else, it doesn't bother anyone else. So, you know, we can usually accommodate those types of requests. Cool. Any other rules of taking care of the trails, working on them that folks need to know? Well, I mean, I think, and then this goes into like, you know, protecting the ecology, but you know, number one thing is not to disturb the wildlife. Uh, mm-hmm. don't cut roots, don't cut the trees. Um, oh, yeah. don't pick the flowers, you know, leave them there for everyone to appreciate. This is, this is where we go to, you know, to recreate This is where we go to see those things. Um, and you know, if, if there's a unique looking flower, then just leave it there for everybody to see and appreciate. And then you can grow some uh, stuff in your backyard. It's like people got a backyard, a front yard. Absolutely. Start doing that. Sure. Start changing the stupid rules of subdivisions that a lot of people have so that you can have natural areas and gardens and stuff instead of just a bunch of stupid grass I'm, that requires a lot of, like, water. <laughs> but what? Yeah, I'm actually doing that this year. The section of my nice. yard between the sidewalk and the road, I'm, 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 I am I'm, just buried a bunch of uh, wildflower seeds in there, so I'm oh, just cool. going to let that flourish. Nice. Yeah, and I can't wait to see what it looks like in springtime. Yeah. Or folks like... Um... I don't care what the HOA says. <laughs> yeah. They need to change, <laughs> please. It's like, it's for the good of everything. Um, and Absolutely. And Mark Merriweather, Vorder um I don't know if he came up with the idea or he got it from someone else, but... Um, the key one thing he recommended is just keep a bird bath in the backyard um and they're going to come and they're going to naturally um leave seeds and so you got all these local seeds they'll leave and um you can just maybe pull out the plants you don't want and leave the natural plants you do and they're native they're used to the local soil the local climate so um yep. they're going to require less care but uh and what are some of the um, rules of the road you have that you talk about besides um, not wearing headphones that keep you from hearing anything? What are the rules of the road? Uh, well, like I said, you know, just, just respecting the, the wildlife, uh, respecting the other trail users, um, understanding that, you know, uh, in the triangle of, of yielding the right of way, horses are on top, bikes um, yield to both pedestrians and equestrians, um, and pedestrians should yield to um, horses. Now, when we say yield, it means when I'm riding and I see a walker or a horse in front of me, I'm going to give them ample time uh, to comfortably move aside so I can pass. Or if we're traveling at approximately the same rate, then um, we can just 
both use the trail at the same time. There's no need to pass. But uh, just being courteous when that exchange occurs uh, is probably the number one thing that's going to keep us tied to the community. Now, it's important, uh, then, like, people can get out and walk, ride their horse um, or bike. And doing that, being aware of your environment, um, helps you get skills you can use in other areas. So pay attention, like, look ahead, look behind, listen. If you got something on, I know there's been some times where I'm running on the trail and I can hear someone behind me and I don't want a biker to have to stop because it's like a pain in the rear end to stop and then to start your bike again. So I get, I move off the trail, I run, keep running or else stand on the side, let them go by. Um, or if I'm going against bike traffic because it's one way, then I'm making sure I'm looking up ahead, looking through the shrubbery, seeing what's going on. Um, if I see a biker, then I'll yell out. And sometimes I just yell out around corners anyway. Runner! But uh, I want to make sure I'm seeing what's going on and getting out, getting out of the way um, so they can continue unimpeded. Because, as I say, it's like can, can be a pain. But I think some people might be a biker upset about horses. But it, it's I think it's important to remember that um, if you stop your bicycle and start again, you might not like it psychologically, but then actually that's something you should be doing more because it challenges you. It's something you don't like. Therefore, it takes more control and um, it's like a good training tool to help you. Sure. And like we said earlier, yeah, like like we said earlier, you know, there's always going to be, you know, jerks and, and any yeah. group of people. Uh, and I just try to stress upon everybody that, that rides a bike and part of PCMTV just to be patient and understanding. You know, one of the things, like I said earlier, that motivates me to work on the trail so much is seeing families out riding together. Now, when I come across, I'm out there riding, and and, uh, and I have to process this by saying I'm not one of those riders that's, you know, logging my miles per hour. I'm logging it, but I really don't care what the number is. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really out there for the time, not, not, Hey, I've got to get 11 miles and <laughs> yeah. I have to be 14 miles per hour. That's, that's, that's not how I ride. Um, but let's say I'm, I, I like to ride slow and appreciate the scenery and stuff like that. But there are those guys out there that are really trying to push themselves or really trying to, um, prepare for a race or, mm -hmm. you know, really meet a physical fitness goal. And I, I respect that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, now, I definitely don't want to get in that person's way, but I also wouldn't want that person to, you know, take their personal fitness goals over the safety of another trail user. So I just always try to stress patience, you know, it's fine, you know, so what you're not going to get a PR this day. But, uh, you know, when I'm I'm riding and I see a family riding together and, you know, the, the kids are always it's just so awesome to see them out on the trails and, and, and enjoying themselves, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I don't want to do anything, you know, to discourage that kid from riding their bike. And, you know, I just always want to, you know, hey, great looking bike, keep going and, you know, just encourage them, you know, True. until and I Amen. can be patient yeah. enough to wait until the end of that trail and just and let them let them really have like a good memory of, hey, I met this stranger on the trail and they complimented yeah. my bike and, and yeah. Yeah, it was a good day. Right. So um, that's always fulfilling for me. And then don't be all short term because you could see that those people again in the future and one day you might need their help. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I've seen it a thousand times where, you know, somebody drops their wallet on the phone and, and somebody turns it in, mm -hmm. you know, or their phone or some expensive piece of equipment that falls oh, yeah. off. And it, it just it happens all the time where uh, a friend of mine keeps forgetting his front wheel at the trail and uh, <laughs> the parks department will pick it up and cool. you know, he'll post on the group. Hey, did somebody by chance pick up the front <laughs> wheel? And you know, the, the park guys are on our group too. So they'll try Sweet. in like, Hey, it's over here at Maskey park. Come by and pick it up. Nice. You know, that's happened a couple of times. So it's, it's really nice to see stuff like that, you know, and then be careful around horses because horses can be flighty. Um, and if you're a little upset about having yeah. to stop for a horse, you could, that could result gotta, in someone being injured or killed. That is a very serious thing. You need to take the horse very absolutely. seriously and really respect it. But yeah, you... and I've got some really good tips for, for moving around horses, especially for somebody that's on a bike. What we typically do is we'll dismount the bike, stop, yeah. and, and 
for the most part, the horse rider stops too. Mm-hmm. So they're going to let us pass. But this is where the patient comes in, where you stop, you say, hey, can we pass? Mm-hmm. Um, and they'll say yes. So what I like to do just to make the horse more comfortable uh, is I take off my helmet, I dismount my bike, I, I talk to it, I click, you know, I, I make sounds that it's used to hearing, I whistle a little bit, you know, speak in a very calm voice and, and try to help calm it down. I mean, I'm this weird looking robot thing with a <laughs> big thing on my head and I'm pushing this thing that makes all kind of clicky noises and, yeah. you know, it looks like a, some weird, you know, uh, voodoo machine. And uh, I always put, I put the bike between myself and the horse for one thing um, and just slowly walk around it while speaking calmly. And, and I've never had an incident where cool. a horse got spooked. I actually... There's one part of our trail that uh, at the end of it is leased out to some people that have um, some horses uh, in, a, in, in stalls. And uh, one time I found one of their miniature horses out on the trails. And uh, I it was very scared. Um, yeah, it was a miniature horse, but still, uh, I would definitely would not like to be on the receiving end of, of that horse's kick. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I was able to, to safe, safely calm it down just a little bit and tie it off to a tree so it so it was out of the way um, for any riders coming behind me. And then I went over to the to the stall and, and let them know where the horse was, so they were able to retrieve the horse. Cool. Um, and it was probably they said it had been out there for a couple of days. So it was probably scared. Wow. I'm sure wow. it was hungry. Poor thing. Yeah. So uh, hmm. yeah, but it got back home safely. Nice. Thanks. So how many miles are the trails? And where do they start and end? Well, there, there, there are a lot of miles to the trails, and it depends on your route, and it depends on how far you want to go. Um, but I would say independent, like if you could get easily 10 miles without crossing over the same path twice. And, and that's just our trail system. So the other interesting thing is, a lot, you know, for a while we would either do two laps if we wanted to get more miles or sometimes three. Um, hmm. And then um, at a, we have another trail that's nearby called Cypress Wood. It's just a little bit to the east of us, about six miles as the crow flies. Hmm, okay. And uh, what we did um, was we found a way to connect the two trails. Cool. And so – there's what we call the connector trail um, or the damn it trail that goes in between <laughs> the two trails. Yeah. They call call us that because there was one section along a, a, a pipeline that was just completely blocked off by trees. Um, and I just went in and I found the route and I cut it out one day. So um, cool. since then it's just kind of uh, <laughs> informally been called the damn it trail. That's funny. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's a, there's a way that you can ride all the way over to the other trail um, if you do both of these trails and all the connector trails, it adds up to about uh, 35 miles, I believe. Wow. Um, there's also some some more trails that are further west of us that are mainly horse trails but can be ridden by bike. Um, and if you do all of that, it's almost 40. Um, hmm. Now, most of this is, is on the trail, and, and there's only very little pavement. So it's, Good. it's really relaxing to be out. Um, and that, that ride takes, you know, anywhere from four to six hours. So imagine just being on the bicycle in the woods, you know, for four to six hours, just uh, out there enjoying this, the scenery and enjoying the environment. Yeah, it's making me relax already. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the CCMTB goes from, um, what, Grant and Cypress Creek down to uh, 249? Pretty much, um, and like I said, there is some, there is a few miles of trail that's uh, east of, I'm sorry, west of Grant. Uh, but for the most part, what we, what we cover pretty much in our group rides is going to be between Grant Road, along the creek, all the way over to 249. And then you got a connector trail going down to the what Cypress the connector, Trails? Yeah, yeah, the connector trail goes under under 249, and it incorporates Kickerilla Mission Preserve. Um, it also includes you know, par- the back part of Meyer Park and the back part of Collins Park. Hmm. And Collins Park is where Cypresswood trails are. 
and that's at the intersection to give you just a frame of reference, Cypress Woods and Spring Stubner, or okay. Stubner Airlines. Hmm. So um, on a map, you can see that the distance is pretty significant, and it's, it's a pretty good ride. Cool. Cool. Well, all right. I got to tutor someone in SAT in like nine minutes, so... As much as I'd Alrighty. like to continue talking, and this is a great conversation, I better like, like, end this conversation and get ready for that guy I got to work with. But uh, any last words, Scott? Sounds for the folks. Um, uh, no, that's that's pretty much it. But uh, if anybody wants to get involved, the best way to do it is to to join the Facebook group and watch for the events and watch for a call for help. That's that's really uh, how we organize everything, and uh, keep picking up litter. <laughs> yeah thanks but yeah so get out um enjoy the trails meet scott um talk to some people on ccmtb um and they'll you know be more than willing to take you out on some trails and show you the area and give you tips for writing um very friendly a lot of good people so uh cool so thanks scott much appreciated uh great conversation thank you michael about thanks the area for having the trails me. yeah thank you so uh hope you enjoyed that folks um keep up with stuff on cc uh ccmtb and on our cceRP and uh get out and enjoy it take care of our area give it some tlc um hope you enjoyed this as i say and we'll talk to you again soon bye folks